<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. How are you all? Welcome to Fristed AMC MCQ free two week sessions again. So, so far we, we had two sessions with you, right? So we, we, we had a discussion about psychiatry. We did a question solve class with you. And tonight we are going to do a theory topic, which is cardiology theory class one. Okay. So let's start the session. And I hope that you guys are enjoying the session so far. This will be a different kind of session today because our main focus will be discussing the theory so that you understand the basic of cardiology and you can utilize this knowledge to solve questions. We have two theory sessions for cardiology and then after that we will do a cardiology question solve class. All right, so let's start with that. Now, for, for, for cardiology, what are the main research that you need to follow? These are the main research that I, I need you guys to have a read at least from JAM, but most of the important topics we will discuss anyway. So these are the chapters from JAM where you have cardiac, these are the cardiac chapters, you can say. So chapter 30, 59, 75, 6, 7, 8. And we will, we will cover most of it anyway in the class. We will also do Kaplan step to CK. And sometimes, as I discussed last time, that RACGP guideline is also important. So if you, if you need to go through some Australian guideline for anything related to medicine, then RACGP guideline will be, will be your, one of the most important things that you can look into. And definitely our lecture note has almost everything that you need. And after that, you will get some QBank related to cardiology as well. Okay. So this is how you should start your cardiac, cardiology preparation. First, you listen to the classes, get an understanding about the important topics. And then you don't need to even read JM. But if you have some time and you want to read the John Murtak book, that's fine. You can do it. Same with the Kaplan step to CK, the important topics, you can just go through that, although we discussed it in the class anyway. Few topics which are important, you can also go through RACGP guideline, okay? Now, the main thing is our lecture note and the topics that we discuss. If you can finish what we are discussing, that's more than enough for your cardiology preparation, all right? And after that, you can, you can go through a QBank, just try to solve some of the cardiology question see how much you are getting right. Once you have done that, then you can appear our cardiology mock test from the portal. Okay, so that should be your step-by-step -step approach. The first topic today is chest pain and our today's class is mainly focusing on chest pain only because chest pain is a very important topic. You will get questions from here, everyone. There is no other way. So. There will be questions from chest pain, so we try to try to discuss as detailed as possible for for chest pain related questions. Okay. So, if a patient comes to you with a chest pain, what are the main differential diagnoses that you should think of? So, definitely cardiac related would be myocardial infarction. That's our first thing that we that we want to rule out. Could be angina could be pericarditis could be vascular related like aortic dissection could be respiratory related like pulmonary embolism is important to rule out pneumonia pneumothorax is also important could be just a esophageal ulcer or peptic ulcer causing chest pain musculoskeletal can be like some patient can get costochondritis someone can get a fracture rib all of these can cause chest pain anyway now, when we get a patient with chest pain, because there is a lot of causes behind a chest pain, so you need to know a little bit more detail about it. Like, if a patient comes to us with chest pain, first thing that I would like to know, 
where exactly is the pain? Is it on the right side or left side? Because if it is on the right side, then I'm not worried about heart. But if it is on the left side, then I am, I am definitely worried about the heart. So that's the first thing that I want to know. The second, how bad is the pain? And what is the type of the pain? So the characteristic of the pain is, is a very important thing. And definitely you should, you should look into that. Okay. Now, if it is a coronary chest pain, like let's say that the pain is coming from the heart itself, the type of the chest pain would be, patient will say it feels very tight or it feels very heavy or pressure feeling. So tightness, heavy feeling, pressured feeling, these are all related to myocardial infarction. Okay. Someone can come to you with a feeling like knife-like stabbing sharp chest pain. When they come to you with a knife-like stabbing chest pain, and patient says that the pain gets better when they lean forward and get worse when they lie down, that can be pericarditis. So sharp stabbing knife-like chest pain, and the pain has, 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 some, has some kind of relationship with change of posture, then you would think of acute pericarditis, okay? So type of the chest pain gives, gives us a bit of clue that what could be the cause. If a chest pain responds to nitroglycerin, it is more consistent that it is either coming from the heart, so it is either an angina patient, or it could be esophageal spasm also. If the chest pain gets worse with nitroglycerin, that suggests gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, so these are important clue. It's not like we will go through all of them one by one, but this is the initial part of chest pain. Like what is the type of the pain? How bad is the pain? Does the pain radiate to anywhere? Especially if a patient comes to us with a sudden onset of left-sided chest pain and the pain radiates to the left arm, neck and jaw, we would be concerned of a myocardial infarction, right? So this is important to know. Now, you can go through all of these other things that is written in here. It's not very really important. We will move on to what are the investigations that we do if a patient comes to us with a chest pain. So, any patient coming to you with a sudden onset of chest pain, especially left-sided chest pain, your initial or next most appropriate investigation should be an ECG. That's a must. Don't forget this because if you, if you don't get these kind of questions right in the exam, the likelihood of passing the exam gets very low because these are very basic questions. Okay? So make sure that you don't miss these things. Someone coming to you with a sudden onset left-sided chest pain and the question asking you what is your next investigation of choice, you definitely do an ECG. You don't choose anything else. What else we can do? If we are suspecting myocardial infarction, then other option would be doing the cardiac enzymes. So we have CKMB, we have cardiac troponin. Which one is more commonly we are doing now? Cardiac troponins. So cardiac troponin are, are very good. They are the preferred marker for diagnosis of myocardial infarction. So, Whenever a patient comes to you with a chest pain, you will first do ECG and your second investigation will be serum troponin. So first thing is ECG. After ECG, the nurse will take the blood and with the blood, we check the troponin and this troponin again will be repeated in 6 to 12 hours. Now, if you look over here, that troponin it takes at least four to six hours 
to become abnormal after after having a chest pain. So someone having a chest pain right now, if you check the troponin now, it might not be elevated straight away. So it can take at least four to six hours to get elevated, and it can persist for at least 10 to 14 days. Okay. How about CKMB? CKMB also gets elevated by four to six hours, but it, it will only last for one to two days in the blood. Now the question comes that definitely we know that the, uh, the preferred investigation for anyone with left-sided chest pain is ECG followed by troponin. Let's say that a patient who you have treated for myocardial infarction, The troponin was very high, let's say 2000. And that patient has been treated already. But after treatment, again, patient complains of chest pain. So patient's initial episode of chest pain was three days ago. And this patient already has been treated. Now, at the moment, so after four, let's say after five days, patient again complaining of exactly the same chest pain. What investigation will you do apart from ECG? Are you going to do a troponin or CKMB? Yes. So you will be doing a CKMB in that situation because we, if we want to check reinfarction in a patient, the best test would be CKMB, not troponin, because the troponin that was elevated, it can stay in the blood elevated for 10 to 14 days. Okay, but first time you are checking for infarction, your investigation of choice is troponin, but for reinfarction, you will be doing CKMB. Okay, that's the only time nowadays we do the CKMB. We don't do CKMB quite often anymore, okay? So apart from ECG cardiac enzyme, sometimes we also do a chest X-ray in a patient who has chest pain, and it is normally done to rule out respiratory causes of chest pain. Like if you're thinking pneumothorax, if you're thinking pleural effusion, then you would do it. Sometimes even in aortic dissection, you can get widening of the mediastinum. So that sometimes can be helpful to diagnose. So chest X-ray can be done if, if needed. Yes, after 14 days, you can again take the troponin for reinfarction that, that you can do. Myoglobin is no longer a good test. Okay, so these are not, not the best test anymore. Troponin is the best because it gives us the best value of myocardial injury. Myoglobin, CKMB, they don't. Okay, and troponin, especially troponin I, that, that's the preferred one everywhere in the world. It's just because that it gives us a very good idea that how much cardiac damage has been occurred. Okay? The higher the value, the, the likelihood, of, likelihood of cardiac damage is also very high. All right, so we know about the investigations. Now, some of the important causes of chest pain. So first we discussed a bit about myocardial infarction. The other than myocardial infarction, aortic dissection can also cause a severe sudden onset chest pain. But the type of the pain will be different. So patient will come to you with a sudden onset of severe, sharp, excruciating, painful, and most of the time it is retrosternal chest pain and it radiates to the back. You can also get loss of pulse in this patient. So sudden onset of severe retroesternal chest pain feels like tearing, sharp, 
extremely severe, radiating to the back, you would think of aortic dissection. In aortic dissection, if we do a chest X-ray, we get widening of the mediastinum. We will show it later on. There is a lot of, lot of things to discuss from aortic dissection. We will come into that later on. Pulmonary embolism. We discussed PE in, in our respiratory class, not in cardiac class. But pulmonary embolism, it comes with sudden onset of chest pain. But along with that, they also have shortness of breath. They get tachycardia, tachypnea. And most of the time, there is a risk factor. Maybe patient had a long flight, did not walk, and then they formed a deep vein thrombosis. Some kind of risk factor will be there to think of pulmonary embolism. Pericarditis, we discussed about it. So pericarditis pain, ideally, it will, the patient will come to you with a, with a sharp, stabbing chest pain relieved by leaning forward and worse with lying down and most of the time there will be a history of recent viral flu-like illness okay if you do ecg in this patient you will get a diffuse st elevation throughout the lips and in this patient troponin ckmv everything will be normal and only thing you will do is anti-inflammatories in this patient Again, we will discuss all of this in detail later on. Yes, the PDFs are already there. So for course student, the PDF of this class is already in the portal. Okay, now this is a, just a table showing some of the important clue to each of the cardiac causes of chest pain. Like if a patient has got myocardial infarction, we know how the pain will be, and pain usually lasts more than 20 minutes. If it is pericarditis, we know how the pain looks like. We know the aortic dissection pain, which is sharp and tearing. Peptic ulcer, it will be epigastric pain, worse with eating. Reflux, patient will complain of reflux, heartburn, those kind of stuff. So if it is costochondritis, Patient will be tender when you will palpate the chest. So this, this is why we are discussing this right now, is that these are the clue which is given in the exam. They give you a bit of clue, like a patient coming to you with, with sore chest. And the, the patient usually gets, it, the pain gets worse after taking a deep breath in. And, and when, the patient, when you palpate the chest wall, it is, so that is something which we would think of costochondritis. Okay, so that's why the important clues you will need to remember because these are usually given in the exam. Now, so far we have done a, like an initial understanding about the chest pain. Now we are moving on to specific conditions, ischemic heart disease. So far, you guys are clear. You are understanding me so far. Any, any confusion? And Dr. Divya, these are part of the class. So these, these are your final cardiac classes. That's right. The course has already started. The initial two weeks are free for everyone. Okay, moving on to ischemic heart disease. So for ischemic heart disease, what is ischemic heart disease? It means that it is one of the commonest cause of death all over the world, right? And it is so common, nowadays patient, patient even, they don't care about it. But it can be quite serious because left untreated, ischemic heart disease will become myocardial infarction and patient can die, right? So it is a very important topic to understand and treat because it is a time-based scenario. Because as the time goes, myocardium will be damaged, 
and patient will die. So that's why understanding ischemic heart disease is very important. And AMC wants each and everything that you know about this ischemic heart disease. So a patient who develops atheromatous plaques or fatty deposition on their coronary arteries, they can get some kind of chest pain which comes with exertion or exercise. And at some point, when they, when they take rest, the pain will, pain will set up. Pain usually does not last more than 10 minutes. And sometimes if they take nitroglycerin spray, the pain will get better. And that is what we call as stable angina. So stable angina means chest pain, which comes with exertion or exercise. At rest, there is no chest pain. So stable angina, it means that they, they already have some kind of atheromatous or fatty deposition in their coronary arteries. Like you can see that only this bit is open. So when they do exercise, sometimes there is more and more oxygen demand. But you can see that the blood flow is already obstructed here. So when there is excessive demand of oxygen and blood, especially during ex exercise, this narrowed blood pipe cannot provide that enough oxygen. So that's why patient feels pain. And after they take rest, the pain is gone. So it's that is a stable angina. Now, left on to it, this stable angina patient can turn into a full-blown acute coronary syndrome patient. Okay? So acute coronary syndrome, it's a medical emergency. There are three variations of acute coronary syndrome. One is unstable angina. Another is non-ST elevated MI. And another is ST elevated MI. When there is myocardial infarction, there is no more, no more opening of the blood vessels. The, the blood vessel or coronary artery is completely blocked. So when it is completely blocked, that is called myocardial infarction. When there is still a bit open, then you can still say it is unstable angina. Okay, but left untreated, unstable angina will become myocardial infarction. So most of the patient can be asymptomatic, but many can be symptomatic either with stable angina or unstable angina. And few will become ST and non-ST elevated myocardial infarction patient. But if you can treat a patient when they're getting a stable angina, you can prevent all of this acute coronary syndrome. So that's why it is important to identify these patients at the earliest possible time. Okay? So, so far we understand that ischemic heart disease, it can be asymptomatic or symptomatic. In symptomatic, we have got a stable angina where patient get chest pain. The chest pain will be same like, like heaviness, tightness on the left side, radiating to the neck, jaw. Sometimes even can be associated with nausea, vomiting, all of those. So, but stable angina will get better with taking rest or with nitroglycerin. Whereas unstable angina will not get better with taking rest and the pain will persist for more than 10 minutes. Same with myocardial infarction, it will not get better with rest. And the pain will be much severe. There will be more, more chance of nausea, vomiting, tachycardia, shortness of breath. All of these symptoms can be there in an MI patient. Okay? So what are the risk factors of developing this acute coronary syndrome or ischemic heart disease? There are some major risk factors. One of them is elevated cholesterol level, especially elevated LDL cholesterol is very important risk. And it is called that LDL cholesterol is the single most important subgroup that carries the risk of ischemic heart disease. Now, question comes from here in a different way. So you need to remember that the single most important risk factor for ischemic heart disease is 
high cholesterol or high LDL. What is the worst risk factor for a patient who has got coronary artery disease? That's diabetes. And what is the most common risk factor? Hypertension. So three things. Most important is LDL cholesterol. Worst risk factor is diabetes. And most common is hypertension. Question comes just exactly like this. They ask you, what is the most common risk factor for ischemic heart disease? Okay. Let's have a look on this question. A 48-year-old woman comes to the office with chest pain that has been occurring over the last few weeks. The pain is not related to exertion. She is comfortable now. The location of the pain is retroesternal. Pain is sometimes associated with nausea. No shortness of breath. Pain does not radiate beyond the chest. No other medical history. What is the most likely diagnosis? So several weeks, patient having a chest pain, which is not related to exertion. That will give you the clue that this is not ischemic heart disease because ischemic heart disease is ideally associated with some kind of exercise or exertion. And for premenopausal patient, having a heart condition is not very common because the estrogen in, in a female patient they usually protect them from a, from a heart attack. But after menopause, the risk is same like men. Okay? So for this patient, a 48-year-old woman who has got several weeks of retroesternal chest pain, not related to exertion, what, what is your likely, likely diagnosis? So it cannot be unstable angina. Pneumothorax will not wait for several weeks. Prince metal angina, again, Prince metal angina, it can have some association with exertion, but we will discuss that later on. We know how the pericarditis pain look like. So even with exclusion, our option is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Yes, nausea can be there. So nausea can be there. Patient can feel that like their food is coming up. So they feel quite sick and nauseous in gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay? So you can see it's written in here, if a 48-year-old woman had chest pain with no risk factor, it would be very unlikely that her chest pain was related to ischemic heart disease. Menstruating women virtually never have myocardial infarction. So, because the estrogen protects. The next question, which of the following is the most dangerous to a patient in terms of coronary artery disease risk factor? So, elevated triglyceride, elevated total cholesterol, decreased HDL, or elevated LDL. We know that elevated LDL has got the highest risk factor. Okay? Okay, now there is another kind of chest pain which many of you might not heard about. It's called tachosubocardiomyopathy. Not very important for exam, but just remember because sometimes they can give you a scenario like this. First, read this question. A postmenopausal woman develops chest pain immediately after hearing the news of her son's death in a world. She develops acute chest pain, dyspnea, ST segment elevation on V2 to V4. So when you see ST segment elevation, immediately you think of ST elevated MI. Elevated le level of troponin confirm acute myocardial infarction. So definitely it is a ST elevated MI, you think. Then you have done a coronary angiogram. So coronary angiogram is an investigation where you can directly look inside the coronary artery and you can find out where exactly is the block and how much blockage is there. In a myocardial infarction patient, there has to be a block, right? But you have found in this patient, the angiogram is normal. You did an echocardiogram which showed apical left ventricular balloning. So that is what we get in tachosubocardiomyopathy. Patient presents to 
presents to us with exactly similar feature like an acute ST elevated MI. But when we do the angiogram, there is nothing there. It's totally normal. Then you do an echo, and echo usually will give you the diagnosis of when you see this ballooning of the left ventricle, then you can think of tacosubo cardiomyopathy. So what is tacosubo? It is a myocardial damage occurs mostly in a postmenopausal women immediately following an overwhelming emotionally stressful event, which is in this case her son's death. It could be divorce, financial issues, earthquake, any of the emotionally stressful event can bring it on. This leads to ballooning and left ventricular dyskinesia. So what happens in this patient, the left ventricle does not move as it should be. And if it doesn't move, it can't give blood supply to the body. And it feels like a chest pain because the coronary artery is also not getting enough blood supply when left ventricle is not working properly. Okay. Now, as with ischemic disease, manage this patient with beta blocker and ACE inhibitor. But definitely you can't do any, you don't need to put any stent inside because there is nothing wrong in the coronary artery. So sometimes you, we can just give them beta blocker or ACE inhibitor. That's usually the treatment. Okay. Kind of broken heart syndrome, you can say. Another question, correcting which of the following risk factor for coronary artery disease will result in the most immediate benefit for a patient? This is another thing that if the patient stops smoking, so smoking suggestion results in the greatest immediate improvement in a patient who has high risk of coronary artery disease. So remember these questions because time to time we have seen this kind of question coming in the exam. Now, a bit interesting topic now, so acute coronary syndrome. So you have got a patient who has got all the similar feature of chest pain, like MI, and you have done an ECG. There are two possibilities that can be happening. One, that there might be ST elevation, if there is ST elevation, you already know it is a ST elevated MI. To confirm ST elevated MI, do we need to do troponin? No. There is no need of waiting for troponin because it is already a ST elevated MI. So if the patient has got classic pattern of chest pain and there is ECG changes of ST elevation, we don't need to depend on troponin to diagnose that it is a MI. This ST elevated MI will directly go to the catheter lab for an angioplasty. Okay, so that's important. Now, the other scenario can be patient has got typical pain and it's not an angina kind, kind of pain because it's not working with the rest, it's not getting better with nitroglycerin. Pain lasting for more than 10 minutes, but there is no ST elevation. So if there is no ST elevation, this kind of pain, either it can be unstable angina or it could be a non-ST elevated MI. Now this is the time your troponin will be helpful. So if troponin negative, then it is unstable angina. If troponin positive, then it's non-ST elevated MI. Okay? So this is the main area where we do the troponin because usually it will help us to, to differentiate if it is a non-ST elevated MI or unstable angina. Now definitely ST elevated MI has the worse prognosis than any other. The other important thing is that for ST elevated MI, thrombolytic therapy is usually important. So if we can either remove the thrombus or if we can dissolve the thrombus by some medication, definitely there will be restoration of blood flow in the coronary artery. And that's our main aim. 
But thrombolytic therapy is only beneficial in ST elevated MI patient. It is not effective in an unstable angina or non ST elevated patient. Okay, remember that we will come to further discussion about it later on. Characteristic of a ischemic chest pain. We already know about it. If it is an acute coronary syndrome, pain will last more than 10 minutes. It will be aggravated by physical activity. Associated shortness of breath, nausea, sweating, lightheadedness can be there. The type of the pain will be squeezing, tightness, heaviness, pressure, but it will not be sharp, pins, stabbing, or knife like. You can go through this later on, like there are some, some of the important clue to the to various, various causes of chest pain, which you can go through. We have already discussed a bit. Okay, I'm going into a little bit more detail of this chest pain. This will become tricky now, okay? But try to understand. So far, we know how to differentiate non-ST elevated MI, unstable angina, and ST elevated MI. How about stable angina patient? There, there will be patient who, who can come to you saying that, Doc, whenever I go for a walk, especially in inclined, inclined road, I, I get chest pain. And if you ask how long, it's just, just for five minutes and it get better after I take rest. So then you will know that this is an angina patient. For an angina patient, if you do a ECG, most of the time resting ECG will be normal. So what else can we do for this patient? Like how can we prevent stable angina to become a myocardial infarction? So that's the point of understanding. So there are few investigations we do in, in this stable angina patient to find out if any of these patients will require further investigation. So, first of all, a stress test. Very common that we do this exercise tolerance test. In a stress test, patient will run on a treadmill. And while patient running on the treadmill, we will be looking at the patient's ECG and any reproduction of the chest pain. Okay. Now, to send a patient for a stress test, there is two important things that you need to know. First of all, when you did the baseline ECG or resting ECG, there was no abnormality in that ECG. Especially on that ECG, you did not get any cardiac related. ECG chains, like no T wave inversion, no ST depression, nothing like that, or no new left bundle branch block. So these three, you, if you have any of these three, T inversion, ST depression, or new onset of left bundle branch block, that means the patient's ECG or resting ECG is already abnormal. So in that case, you can't send the patient for a stress test. Because patient needs to run on a treadmill, what if a patient who is 60 having a very bad osteoarthritis of the knee joint and you send that patient for running on a treadmill, that patient will just not like you ever, okay? Will be very angry with you. So a patient who can't exercise or frail elderly patient, you would not send them to run on a treadmill because there are other options available. So first of all, if we send a stable angina patient, remember it is only for a stable angina or it is also for chest pain who you are not understanding what's the cause of chest pain. So diagnostic dilemma or a stable angina patient, that's the time you will be doing this test, not for a unstable angina or a MI patient, definitely. So first is a stress test. In the stress test, there are two criteria. One patient can exercise. Second, there is no baseline ECG abnormality. If this fulfills the criteria, 
you can send the patient for a stress test. Now, what if you cannot read the ECG? What if there is baseline ECG abnormality? What will you do then? So then you will try to try to exert the heart in different ways. So there are two other methods of detecting ischemia without the use of ECG. So one is nuclear isotope scan, which is also known as myocardial perfusion scan, or you can do an echocardiogram. Okay? So what happens with this isotope scan? So you will insert a isotope in the patient's vein and let's say nuclear isotope such as let's say you are inserting a thallium isotope. If you insert a thallium isotope in the patient's vein or in the patient's blood, that thallium isotope will go to the heart or coronary arteries. This is called myocardial perfusion scan, right? So if these are your coronary arteries, if there is no block in the coronary artery, dye will pass through the coronary artery into the cardiac muscle. So every part of the cardiac muscle will equally take that thallium scan or thallium dye. So if there is no block, the whole myocardium, the uptake of this isotope will be equal or homogeneous. Now what if just this part, this part of the muscle did not uptake similar kind of thallium like the other part. It means that most likely the right coronary artery having some block, that's why this part of the heart did not take thallium like it should be. Then you would know that something is wrong in the right coronary artery. So it is something like looking at the heart based on the muscle perfusion. Okay, is it making sense for everyone, guys? So it's a bit di difficult, but I hope I am able to, like, un at least you can understand it. Great, so no problem with understanding this. That's very good. So either we do this nuclear isotope scan or myocardial perfusion scan. That's one option. Or the second option could be just sending the patient for an echocardiogram and echo can find out if there is any regional wall motion abnormality. Like if any of the heart wall is not moving as it should be. If it is not moving, it means this part of the heart is not getting enough blood. Okay, so if a patient have baseline ECG abnormality, which include left bundle branch block, left ventricular hypertrophy, using pacemaker, any of this is there, we would go for, most of the time, we will go for this nuclear isotope scan or echocardiogram. The second thing, patient baseline ECG is normal, but patient cannot exercise. That means you still can't do the stress test. So in that case, you will need to give something which will, which will make the heart as if it is actually exercising. So you can give some chemical which can run the heart. So that's what we call as dipyridamol or adenosine combined with thallium. So what does it mean? Now you are going to do a thallium isotope scan. So myocardial perfusion scan is there, but with the myocardial perfusion scan, because patient cannot exercise, you will give dobutamine or dipyridamol. So you will give dipyridamol. And when you give dipyridamol, 
the heart will heart will work as if you are running on a treadmill okay so this patient because he can't exercise the only option we have is we will do the thallium isotope scan plus we will give a chemical to increase the oxygen consumption of the heart so that's dipyridamo so that's our one option another option is we will do the echocardiogram but we will give dobutamine when we are doing the echocardiogram that's called a stress echocardiogram so dobutamine will increase myocardial oxygen consumption and it can also provoke ischemia okay now this is about all the tests that we have discussed so far so first of all we have got exercise tolerance test or a stress test it is ideal when there is no ecg abnormality so ecg fine and patient can also exercise what if patient having a baseline ecg abnormality when a patient has got baseline ecg abnormality but they can exercise then our option will be helium isotope scan or a echocardiogram so patient will be running on a treadmill and during that time we will also give the dye so that's exercise thallium test or exercise thallium scan okay so if a patient has patient has baseline ecg abnormality but patient can exercise then we have got two options one exercise thallium or exercise echo what if patient cannot exercise but ecg normal then you will do either a dipyridamol thallium or a dobutamine echo i know it is quite complex right but just think that when there is a ecg abnormality but patient can exercise then we will do exercise isotope or exercise echo but when patient can't exercise we will give chemical so for thallium we do dipyridamol for echo we do dobutamine okay sounds good for everyone any question Dobutamine is a chemical, and it will not, you will you will not be able to get findings on the ECG because that chemical will also like it will it works in that way so that the thallium scan can show show some abnormality. Okay, just by ECG, it's not the best. They do ECG along with that, but normally we just don't do ECG with this kind of chemical. We also do do the that isotope scan. Okay, but they do like 12 lead ECG will be done along with this. There's the thing, right, Dr. Vindia? If a patient has got ECG changes, such as there is ST depression, T wave inversion, they don't need an exercise ECG. So we don't do it. At that time, we send the patient directly for a coronary angiogram. But these patients, the one that we have got so far, they don't have any, any ECG abnormality. And the ECG abnormality that we are talking about is left bundle branch block, left ventricular hypertrophy using pacemaker. So these are the main ones. But someone who has got 
like typical chest pain and has got ST depression or TOF inversion, for them we, would, we can directly send them for a coronary angiogram. Yes, Dr. Sidra, so thallium is scanned with dipyridamol for perfusion defect and dobutamin, dobutamin echo for wall motion defect. That's right. So echo can only look at the wall motion and thallium scan looks for perfusion. Okay. And the baseline ECG abnormality, these are the baseline ECG abnormality, left bundle branch block, left ventricular failure, if a patient is on pacemaker, or if a patient having ECG changes, suggesting digoxin toxicity. Okay, so again, to to recapitulate what we have discussed with this thing. So if a patient has got stable angina feature, then if the patient does not have any baseline ECG abnormality and they can exercise, we will send the patient for a stress test. If a patient can exercise, but there is baseline ECG abnormality, then either we do the thallium isotope scan or we do a echocardiogram. If a patient cannot exercise, then we will give some chemical so that patient is exercising or heart is exercising. So with the thallium scan, we give dipyridamol. With the echocardiogram, we give dopamine. Okay, very straightforward if you understand what we discussed. Now, you have got a man with atypical chest pain found to have normal nuclear isotope uptake in the myocardium at rest. So you've got an atypical chest pain with a normal thallium uptake at rest. On exercise, there is decreased uptake in the inferior wall. So you have done exercise thallium test for this patient. Two hours after exercise, the uptake returns to normal. So what, what does this mean? It means this patient has got exercise intolerance or when the, whenever he, he does exercise, he shows features of myocardial damage or he shows features of lack of myocardial perfusion, which means this patient has got ischemic heart disease. So for something like that, what will you do next? The next thing is to find out how bad it is, how much blockage it is, and is this patient will get benefited from putting a stent or if this patient will require a bypass surgery. So we are doing prevention, not treatment, okay? So this patient has reversible ischemia on the stress test. This is exactly the person who needs angiography. Okay, so we say that someone who we think that the patient might be having a chest pain related to angina, but baseline ECG is normal, and we send the patient for any of this scan, it comes back positive, saying that yes, this patient has got ECG changes when there is exercise. That patient will require a coronary angiogram. What angiogram will do? Angiogram will be able to detect the anatomical location of the coronary artery disease. It can also say how much blockage is there and which one will be best for this patient. Are we going to go for a stent like angioplasty or this patient will require a bypass surgery? Have a look. We say that stenosis less than 50% is insignificant. And only time we would think of putting a stent into a coronary artery if it is a symptomatic patient and having at least 70% blockers. So you have got a patient with 
chest pain and it looks like a ischemic heart disease first thing is we do a ecg resting ecg is there any resting ecg abnormality no so no ecg abnormality then we think okay is this patient able to exercise yes he can exercise so send the patient for a stress test if a stress test shows during exercise or during running on the treadmill patient had chest pain or there is ecg showing st depression t wave inversion that means it's a positive stress test you send the patient for a angiogram angiogram can show either one or two vessel having stenosis more than 70 percent then we will go for a stent three vessel disease or two vessel disease in a diabetic patient that's required cabg or required bypass surgery okay what if patient is not able to exercise if a patient is not able to exercise you will need to make the heart running as if it is exercising so how we do that we do chemical so chemical stress test so either dipyridamol thallium or dobutamine echo but if there is resting ecg abnormalities then you will go for like either exercise thallium or exercise echo okay so this is actually the step by step app and that is a cardiologist follows day by day that this is what is supposed to be followed in this kind of patient okay are you guys clear about this step because this is something which comes in exam and candidates are so confused with this because it's not quite easy to understand Time to time, you will also see this halter monitoring in the option. Please do not choose halter monitor as your answer in a chest pain patient. So halter monitor is a continuous 24-hour ambulatory ECG monitor that records the heart rhythm. So halter monitor mainly detects rhythm disorders like if a patient has got atrial fibrillation, supraventricular tachycardia, those, those are the things that you look for in a halter monitor. But someone who has got ischemia or chest pain, halter has nothing to do with that. Okay, so remember that if you are suspecting rhythm disturbance, then only you do a halter monitor. All right, everyone, now we are going to take a 10 minute break. And after that, we will, we will go further into acute myocardial infarction management, which is super important for exam. 10 minute break, thank you.
Mm. All right, everyone, let's start again. So first of all, let's talk about Dr. Vindya. So Dr. Vindya, if resting ECG shows ischemic changes, can't we go for angiogram directly? Yes, we will go directly. So as I said, that if the resting ECG shows there is sign of ischemic changes, such as ST, ST depression, T wave inversion, then we don't need to go for a stress test. We can go directly for angiogram. That's right. Moving on to acute myocardial infarction management. Let's start with a question first. A 48-year-old woman comes to the office with chest pain that has been occurring over the last several weeks. The pain is not reliable to exertion. She is comfortable, location retrosternal, ECG normal. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Now, this question we already know that this is a gastroesophageal reflux disease case. But they're asking in here that what you want to do next in this patient? Like, do you want to know a little bit more? Like, 48 year old, are we, do we want to do more cardiac tests? Now, most of the time, this will not be the exam case. This patient will have several other cardiac risk factors, such as maybe they will say that this patient has got hypertension, known as smoker, family history of ischemic heart disease. So when those will be there, this patient still might be high risk, even at 48. So for someone like that, what after ECG, if it is normal, what will you do next? Definitely, it is not a myocardial infarction, so we don't need to do any of this. We don't need to do echocardiogram just yet. Angiogram, CT, so nothing like this. This patient can, we can send them for a exercise tolerance test. Given that ECG is normal and this pain is occurring over several weeks, this is definitely not a case of acute myocardial infarction. So there is no role of doing a troponin in this patient. But what we can do is to send this patient for a stress test and see if she is having any, any chest pain relating to exertion. Clear everyone? But again, I don't like this question because this, this kind of patient, I would not be very concerned if they don't have any kind of risk factor. But this is your question. Sometimes in exam, this might be the case that it's not always the best question that will come in the exam, but we will have to choose an option. So for such a scenario, it could be like only thing that we want to rule out is if this patient has got ischemic heart disease. So we have done the ECG that is normal, and then we can do a stress test. They say not reliably, so they are not sure about this, about this thing. Again, I say that it is not the best question, and you don't have any other option to choose, so you have to choose something, right, in the exam. So think in that way. I know it is not the best question, and I don't also like it, but sometimes you will have to choose an option in, from the options that is given. So from the options that is given, the only best option is sending the patient for a stress test. But ideally, this patient doesn't need to go for a stress test, okay? Now, if a patient presents to you with a symptom of ST elevated MI or acute coronary syndrome, let's say, what is our first thing that we should do? So you have done an ECG, whether it is showing ST elevated, non-ST elevated MI, the management is same initially. So everyone, we will start with aspirin. Aspirin is the first line management for every patient who has got acute coronary syndrome-like symptom. Okay? So... We say monotherapy. Mona 
A is aspirin, which is the most important management. Then we have got nitroglycerin. So if the patient has got chest pain, which definitely will be, you can give nitroglycerin. O for oxygen. So if saturation less than 94, you can give oxygen. And M for morphine, that's for chest pain as well. So monotherapy is the treatment of choice for everyone who has got likelihood of acute coronary syndrome. Okay. So which one to choose in, in between, like you have got morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin in the option. Which one will you choose? You will always choose aspirin because aspirin can prevent further myocardial damage. So that's the most important medication. Okay. So apart from aspirin, sometimes we can also add clopidogrel in these patients, but we will avoid clopidogrel or any blood thinner in patients who are likely to go for an emergency coronary bypass surgery. Like a patient who has got ST elevated MI, you would not start them with clopidogrel or any other, any other blood thinner because that's, that patient will go to emergency coronary bypass surgery. Okay? But someone who will not go for emergency bypass surgery, like an unstable angina patient, you can definitely start them with clopidogrel. For patients who you suspect non-ST elevated MI or unstable angina, the best blood thinner is heparin. Okay. Coming to the questions and then we will move on a little bit more. Yes, we will give aspirin to any acute coronary syndrome patient. That include non-ST elevated MI. That include unstable angina and ST elevated MI. Let's see this question. 70 year old woman comes to the ED with crushing substernal chest pain for the last one hour. The ECG shows ST elevation from V2 to V4. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? Now, in your exam, definitely you will not get all these options. But what do you think will, will you do in an ST elevated AMI patient? So do you want to do morphine, troponin, send the patient to ICU? No. So your first thing is aspirin. That's your main one. Okay. So as soon as you find this patient has ST elevated AMI or a acute coronary syndrome, you will start them with aspirin. So aspirin lower mortality with acute coronary syndrome, and it is critical to administer it as rapidly as possible. With only one hour since the onset of pain, neither the CKMB nor the troponin will be elevated yet. Morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin should all be administered, but they do not lower mortality, and they are not as important as aspirin. Okay, so that's the important thing to remember. Have a look on this question. Same patient, 70 year old women having crushing chest pain, ST elevation, but you have given aspirin to this patient. Then what will you do? So your CKMB, oxygen, nitroglycerin, morphine, thrombolytics, metoprolol, atorvastatin, angioplasty, troponin, lisinopril. Now, this is the confusing part where a lot of candidates get super confused. Remember, this is one of the, one of the time when we will need to choose things which can lower mortality especially for exam. And after aspirin, the, the management which lower mortality is angioplasty or sending the patient for emergency coronary angiogram followed by angioplasty. 
So angioplasty or sending the patient to the catheter lab, that's the next step. Okay. Now we'll see in here the answer is H. Angioplasty is associated with the greatest mortality benefit of all the steps listed in this question. Now all of the answers are partially correct because all of them should be done for the patient. But morphine, oxygen, nitrine do not clearly lower the mortality. It will be given to this patient, but whenever this kind of question come in the exam, especially for a ST elevated MI, our main, our main purpose is to send the patient to the catheter lab. That's the main purpose. And exam usually wants to know that. Okay? So aspirin followed by catheter lab, angioplasty, that's our main two important thing. And that is what we are going to choose in the exam. Okay? Clear everyone? Don't get confused with that because these questions, they, they usually try to know that, that are you choosing the most important step? Okay, like obviously morphine, nitroglycerin is mainly for pain. Oxygen, if patient oxygen saturation is low, then we can give it. So do, those do not lower mortality. But sending the patient for angioplasty and restoring the blood flow, it does. It does lower the mortality. Okay. So that's why we are going to choose that. So angiography is just to look at the coronary artery to know where exactly is the block. So that's angiography. Angioplasty percutaneous coronary intervention, standing, these are the same thing. Okay? And catheter lab is the place where all of these are happening. Okay? It is not a CT angioplasty. This, this is kind of like going through the, going through the groin, groin vein, like femoral, like you go through the groin and you go into the coronary artery and then you find out the block, put a stand there. So this is the invasive one. No, clopidogrel will not be the best option in this case because this patient is going for, going for an operation or surgery. And if you give clopidogrel, it can increase the risk of bleeding. Clopidogrel will be given after we put the stand in, not before. And again, Dr. Nahid, I know the question. I, that's why I, I have shown you the guideline that we are saying. I know what what a lot of candidates think. They think that, well, aspirin is given, why don't we go for the next? What is actually next? They, all of them, oxygen, morphine, nitroglycerin, all of them are next. But can we choose any of them which will lower the mortality? That is the main part of this question. There are a few questions in the exam where, where time-based management is the priority. Cardiac condition, especially myocardial infarction, the time matters a lot. And the question usually assesses the most important step. The most important step after aspirin is sending the patient for angioplasty. Okay? So think in that way. And Dr. D, the answer is angioplasty. Okay. 
Have we got angiography in, in, in the option? We haven't got any angiography. Dr. Cho, the only option we have got here is angioplasty. Okay, move on. A man comes to the emergency department with chest pain for the last hour that is crushing in quality and does not change with respiration or position of the body. An ECG shows ST segment depression in lead B2 to B4. Aspirin has been given. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? So what is this kind of pain? So as we can see, this patient is not, hasn't got a ST segment elevation. It is ST depression, right? So it's a chest pain more than an hour, which means it is an acute coronary syndrome. At least that we know. We have done the ECG and it's not ST segment elevated MI. So either it is an unstable angina, or it is a non-ST elevated MI, right? For this patient, you have given aspirin. That's a good step. What will you do next? This patient having the pain for one hour, doing troponin CKMB might not be the best option because it might not get elevated yet, okay? And you don't have that in the option as well. So. What will you do? Low molecular weight heparin is the best. Thrombolytics, AB6CMAB, nitroglycerin, morphine, angioplasty, metoprolol. Remember, for unstable angina or non ST elevated MI, angioplasty is not the option. Angioplasty or a stent is only time we go for it if there is a full block, which is what we find in a ST elevated MI patient. Okay? So, angioplasty is not our option in here. Metoprolol, not important at the moment. This is not important as well. So again, thrombolytics is also not, not the ideal treatment for unstable angina or non ST elevated MI. So I, both thrombolytics and angioplasty, this is only given in, in a ST elevated MI patient. Remember that. Now we have got nitroglycerin, morphine, and low molecular weight heparin. Remember, after aspirin for either unstable angina or non ST elevated MI, heparin is the best option or it lowers the mortality in this group of patients. Okay. So, same in here, answer is heparin. Heparin will prevent a clot from forming in the coronary arteries. It does not dissolve the clot that has already been formed, but when the patient has ACS, there is no ST segment elevation. There is no benefit of thrombolytic therapy. Nitroglycerin, morphine, oxygen are not associated with a reduction of mortality. Okay, so for cardiac questions, mortality is the mo is the main priority when we are choosing an option. Okay, remember that, please. So. So far, you have got the idea that if it is a patient of acute coronary syndrome, aspirin is the first thing that we choose. Then we look at the ECG. Is the ECG showing ST segment elevated MI? If it is, then we send the patient for angioplasty. Okay, now for angioplasty, patient will have angiography. So don't make it this much confusing, please. Is the, as I said, that angiography is just looking into the coronary artery. And then angioplasty is putting the stent into the blocked arteries, okay? So you need to go do angiogram first to do the angioplasty. So, and the exam questions will not be that much like, <laughs> it will not be like that. They will give you angiography and angioplasty as an option. Very unlikely that they will play like that. So, Again, if they do, then angioplasty is the most important thing. So, for patient who has got ST elevated MI, angioplasty is our, is our best option after aspirin. If it is not ST elevated MI, 
either it's an unstable angina or known as the elevated MI, we still don't know. For that patient, aspirin followed by low molecular weight heparin. That these two lower the mortality. Okay. We don't do percutaneous coronary intervention in non ST elevated MI. Not an urgent one. Now we are talking everything as urgent basis. Okay. And we are coming into that. So give me some time to go through this one by one. We are still on the question. We haven't gone into the discussion about this. So the main thing is that the urgency. These patients who, who need especially ST elevated MI, they are needing an urgent angioplasty. But definitely a non-ST elevated MI, they will not have an urgent PCI, but at some point they will also have an angiogram and if needed, they might, might go for a stenting as well. But it's not an urgent thing. Did it make any sense, guys? I don't, I don't think that it, it did. But are you guys understanding at all like what I'm trying to say? All right, moving on. So, few thing is under like now we are going into the discussion of this ST elevated MI and all this other thing. Have a look in here. Early coronary angiography within forty eight hours and revascularization are recommended in patient with non ST elevated MI. So, that means for a patient who has got ST elevated MI. For that patient, you need to go for an urgent angiogram followed by angioplasty. So, urgent means within 90 minutes. For non ST elevated MI, it's not urgent. You have got at least 48 hours to do the angiogram and treat the patient accordingly. That's the difference. The urgency is the difference. Management more or less will be same. So ST elevated MI, we know about how the pain will become. We know about everything. And we know that how the, how, how the ST elevated MI or MI pain will look like. So you can go through that. Management. So Initial management for all patients with possible MI is to keep them on a cardiac monitor. And definitely aspirin is important unless it is contraindicated. If someone has got allergy to aspirin, you can't do anything. That patient cannot have aspirin. And it's quite uncommon to have, have a anaphylaxis to aspirin. Nitro pain control like morphine should be given if it is required. Like if the patient is in severe pain, we can definitely give this to the patient. Oxygen is usually given if saturation is coming down low. Patient with ST elevated MI usually have a completely occluded coronary artery. That's why the problem is that because it is completely occluded, the part of the cardiac muscle doesn't get any kind of oxygen. So it goes for myonecrosis, and that's why restoring the coronary patency as promptly as possible is a key determinant of outcome of this patient. So emergency perfusion is must for ST elevated MI patient. Patient with ST elevated MI who present within 12 hours of onset of the symptom should have a reperfusion strategy promptly. Reperfusion can be obtained either with fibrinolytic therapy such as streptokinase or percutaneous coronary intervention. Okay. So 
a patient who has st elevated mi for that particular patient if they pay, if they present within 12 hours of chest pain then you can send the patient urgently for a reperfusion treatment reperfusion either can be a pci or can be fibrinolytic therapy PCI is the best, and that is what we will what we will choose in the most of the cases, except if it is a rural setting where there is no catheter lab available, and you can't even send the patient to a tertiary hospital in the due time, then you will choose fibrinolytic therapy. Okay. Clear everyone that. Now, this is a confusing part. A lot of people think that within 90 minutes of chest pain, patient needs to send for PCI. Otherwise, you can't send them for PCI. It's not like that. Within 12 hours, if the patient presents, presents then we can choose this reperfusion strategy. Patient presenting with non-ST elevated MI will not benefit from thrombolytics. Now, what is the typical ECG evaluation of a ST elevated MI? This sometimes I have seen that it comes in exam. For a patient who has got ST elevated MI, immediately, they get a hyperacute T wave followed by ST segment elevation, then they get Q wave, and then they get T wave inversion. So, this is a step by step ECG changes in a ST elevated MI. For ST elevated MI, emergency reperfusion treatment is important. And the choice we have is either a percutaneous coronary intervention and thrombolytic therapy. PCI is the best available treatment if we have it. And it can be done within 12 hours. Which one is best, PCI or thrombolytic? Definitely PCI. In general, a time delay of 90 minutes from the first medical counter to PCI is maximum desirable. So this 90 minute confuses a lot of candidates. So this 90 minute is a patient enters into the hospital with a ST elevated MI. You have to organize a reperfusion treatment within 90 minutes. Okay, it's not 90 minutes from the onset of symptom. It is 90 minutes from the first time this patient entered into your hospital. Okay. Where PCI is delayed or not available, reperfusion with thrombolytic therapy should occur unless contraindicated. So thrombolytic such as streptokinase tissue type plasminogen activator, it will just destroy the clot and it will reduce the infarct size. And same, you can only choose thrombolytics or it is actually beneficial to use the thrombolytics if it can be given within 12 hours of onset of symptom. But you can't give thrombolytics in these patients. So if a patient has got active bleeding disorder, significant closed head or facial trauma within three months, you suspect there is an associated aortic dissection, previous history of brain hemorrhage or ischemic stroke in the last three months. So this these patients cannot cannot have fibrinolytic therapy. So we are talking about if a patient presents within 12 hours, we will either choose PCI or fibrinolytic therapy based on the availability, right? What if patient presents late? What if they are presenting after 12 hours? So reperfusion with PCI or fibrinolysis is not routinely recommended in patients who are asymptomatic, hemodynamically stable, and present more than 12 hours after symptom onset. 
Okay, so for them, what will you do? For them, it is not an urgent reperfusion that you need to organize. But within the next 48 hours, you will you will organize a coronary angiogram, and based on the block, either the patient might need a stent or or a bypass surgery. Okay, so it depends. Okay, now let's let's make a summary of all this treatment that we are discussing so far. So summary would be, let's say we have got a patient with ST elevated MI. Our first thing is to give them aspirin. And we will give them morphine and all other things as required. But as part of the exam purpose, aspirin is the first thing that we will choose, followed by thrombolytics. So thrombolytics, it includes PCI and fibrinolytic therapy. So you, if the patient comes within 12 hours of onset of symptom, then we can send the patient for PCI. If PCI is not available, then we will go for fibrinolytic therapy. Okay, so ST elevated MI, First, first, we give aspirin, followed by if patient presents within 12 hours, then we will send the patient to the catheter lab to have a angioplasty done or PCI done. If PCI is not available, then fibrinolytic therapy. This is clear? Great. How about non ST elevated MI? For a non ST elevated MI, aspirin is our first choice. Then our next choice is low molecular weight heparin. For this group of patients, urgent reperfusion is not needed. So for them, within 48 hours, you will organize a coronary angiogram. And based on the finding, either this patient will require a stent or they might need a bypass surgery. Okay? So this patient will go for a coronary angiogram within 48 hours. So that's a summary. Basically, if you remember up to this, you are fine. You are good for the exam. Yeah, you can say in that way. So 40, within 48 hours, we need to go for a coronary angiogram for that patient if it is a non ST elevated MI. What if a patient who has got ST elevated MI but presented after 12 hours of onset of symptom, but they are, and also they are hemodynamically stable? For that patient, what will you do? Definitely aspirin. But for this patient, there is no requirement for an urgent reperfusion. So for them, again, are you only give them aspirin, nothing else? This patient already has got a AMI. So you will do something. So what will you do? You will organize a coronary angiogram within the next one to two days. But it's not urgent that you have to send them like straight away for catheter lab. But this patient also will require an angiogram to know how much block he has got. And based on that, either he will require a stent or a CABG. Is this is making sense now for everyone? I hope it does. So at least more than 70% block should be there to consider angioplasty.
Very good. So that's all that we wanted to discuss, at least about this myocardial infarction. And you can understand how confusing it can be. Now you have treated a patient with acute myocardial infarction. What is the most common cause of death? Most common cause of death after AMI is ventricular fibrillation that comes in exam. Sometimes after treatment of MI, a patient can develop a condition called Dresler syndrome, which is a kind of pericarditis. So if a patient presents with like post MI treatment, let's say after months of MI treatment, they're coming to you with a left-sided chest pain, sharp stabbing, get worse with lying down. So it's pericarditis. And there is a name for that called Dresler syndrome. Same treatment is with aspirin and SAID. Seventy percent. So at least seventy percent block has to be there for consideration of a stent. The thing is, the damage has already been occurred, and doing a emergency. Plasty will not reduce or improve the outcome. That's the thing. No, it's not like that. So if block is less than 70%, should we go for fibrinolytic? No. You have to remember that angioplasty or fibrinolytic. Okay? And fibrinolytic only we do it in case of a like a emergency perfusion treatment. So not as a regular part of treatment. Okay. So if block is less than 70%, which is unlikely for someone presenting with MI. So someone who is who has MI, definitely they have more than one or at least one vessel which is having more than 70% block. So that's usually the case. So for that patient, most likely they will go for a stand. Okay. But you will not give fibrinolytic if there is less than 70% block. If there is less than 70% block, then that patient will be medically treated. So no stent, no CABG, just medical treatment to control blood pressure, control cholesterol, those things. Now, there was a term we used called fringe metal angina or variant angina, very uncommon condition in which severe angina are triggered when one of the major coronary arteries suddenly goes into a spasm. So prince metal angina is nothing but a spasm of the coronary artery. When these episodes occur, there will be ST segment elevation on the ECG. So as opposed to typical angina, prince metal angina usually occur at rest, most at night and in early morning. Okay. If you send the patient for exercise test or coronary angiogram, it will come normal. The only way to confirm the diagnosis is to go for an argonovin test. If you give argonovin to this patient, that will cause coronary artery spasm. And when, when the patient has coronary artery spasm, if you do an ECG, you will see ST segment elevation. That will confirm the diagnosis. So it is nothing but a spasm of the coronary artery and it's a sudden episode. So whenever there is a spasm, patient gets chest pain. It is not related to exertion because even at rest, it can happen. But when these episodes happen, ST segment elevation can happen as well. But if you do a coronary angiogram, everything will be normal. Then you would think of this condition. Okay. And then you can do an argonovin test, which will confirm the diagnosis. Because it goes a spasm, you have to give something which can dilate the coronary artery. So what can dilate the coronary artery? Either a calcium channel blocker or a nitrate. Okay? So that's all about myocardial infarction and things. Moving on to aortic dissection. So aortic dissection, you already know the presentation. So there will be a sudden, severe, midline, tearing or ripping sensation pain. 
most commonly red to sternal and radiated it can radiate to the back and sometimes even to the abdomen flank and leg if you check the pulse you can get unequal pulses in in the radial arteries or femoral arteries okay so it's very classic presentation patient will the the type of the pain will lead you to think that this is aortic dissection so if you suspect aortic dissection what is your confirmatory investigation so because this is chest pain definitely you will do a ecg first and in the ECG, you might not get any abnormality. Then you might even want to do a chest X-ray where you can get a widening of the mediastinum. But the confirmatory test is transesophageal echocardiography. So very important. And if transesophageal echocardiogram is not in the option, then CT angiogram is another option that we can do. Okay, but transesophageal echo, so which is called toe, toe is the best investigation to diagnose a aortic dissection. Aortic dissections are two types. So this is the ascending aorta, and you have got three big arteries. So one is brachiocephalic artery, carotid artery and subclavian artery right if dissection happens proximal to the subclavian artery that's called type a dissection if dissection happen distal to the subclavian artery that's type b dissection which one is worse type a because it's closer to the heart so type a needs surgical management and most of these patients will die Type B has better prognosis. For type B, this patient usually presents with a severe high blood pressure. So for them, your first line of management is to gradually reduce the blood pressure. Not significantly, you will not drop the blood pressure at once. Gradually reduce the blood pressure. And the choice of blood pressure medication is IV beta blocker, which is IV labetable. So IV labetolo will be your first line management. If still blood pressure is too high, you can add IV nitroprusside with that. And after that, sometimes if surgery needed, you can, you can also order that. But for type B aortic dissection, your first line management is antihypertensive. For type A, emergency surgery. Yeah, we are not thinking about abdominal aortic dissection. This is in the thoracic, so it's mostly ascending aortic, ascending aorta, or a part of descending aorta. So this part. So definitely, we are not talking about abdominal aortic aneurysm, and definitely for abdominal aortic aneurysm, we would not do toe. Toe is mainly for aortic dissection, which is the ascending one. So the type A is proximal to the subclavian artery. So this is their subclavian artery. Proximal to the subclavian artery, any tear is type A, and distal to subclavian artery is type B. So that's all about chest pain. We don't discuss pulmonary embolism in our cardiac class. We discuss pulmonary embolism in, in our respiratory class. Okay? So this is it for tonight. We still have few things left for cardiology. Not few, a lot of others. So in our next class, we will finish most of them. The only thing we don't discuss in, in the free session is ECG and palpitation chapter. That will be done with the course students later on. 
Okay. But other than that, cardiology will be finished in the next class. The, the course has already been started, Dr. Prakash. And after the free two week session is over, which so let me have a look on our on Facebook when our free two free two weeks is over. So free two week session will run up to twenty third of March. So after that we will have our just the course students will will have the ongoing classes. So that will be from 26th. So our free two week session will be finished on 23rd. Dr. Sumaya, um, we, most likely we haven't got your email because it should not be two weeks that, that we haven't replied you. Either it's it went into the junk or or we haven't received that. Can you send me an inbox, Dr. Sumaya? Are you with our Facebook group? Send me an inbox and then we can also help you to get registered. So we have already given Dr. Faria, so we have already given the schedule of the classes. So let me show you where, where you can see that. So if you go to our first aid AMC MCQ group, you'll see the class schedule given for the first two weeks. So that was our today's class. So next class will be on 15th. So 15th is Friday. And QBank, you can read any QBank. You can, like the, the common one people use is Amidex or M plus X. So any of them is fine. You can read it. It's not needed for, for your preparation because we'll be doing all of, the, all of the questions solved and everything for you anyway. So it's not must for you. And Dr. Musharat, I know that the portal can be quite tricky, right? So give me these two weeks. After the two weeks, we will, we will go through the portal. For everyone on the orientation class, we will go through the portal, how to use it and everything. Okay. For now, just try to explore around, just see what you find out from there. Okay. And if I can manage some time, I might just, just like maybe upload a recording of how to how to use the portal. I will give it a try. Yes, after the class, yes, definitely, Dr. Shabab, you should go through the lecture notes. How many hours of video in total do you provide? I can't say that. There is like hundreds and hundreds of videos. So I, I can't even like know that. But there is a huge amount of videos, five years videos, 60, 70 classes in each batch. So there's a lot. And Dr. Faria, what's the Facebook? Uh, only time we will not accept your request in the Facebook group if your ID is very new or suspicious. So if it is a new ID, we would not accept that. Otherwise, we would. Now, to join the course, I said that 
it's important if you if you think that well it's they just join the course because i'm liking the classes and it is something which i'd like so in that case i would definitely advise for everyone to start the process because again it can take some time at the moment so even one week time is now we need at least a week to to give all the access to you so if you if you think that well this is the this is the course that i want to go for then definitely start the preparation definitely send either send me an inbox so if you go in this first aid amc mcq all you need to do is to just send an inbox in this profile so in my profile or you can even send us the email so email id you can get over here so if you go through go at the end of the course detail of any of our post and you'll see our email id so send us an email we have the team members in email who can also help you. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we will up update you the whole schedule for topic wise for the whole course, but after two weeks, free session is over. Okay. At the moment, we are mainly focusing on finishing the two weeks, and after that, we will, we will update a lot everything that you require mm -hmm. no 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 it's a anyone can join the course at the moment so we haven't closed the registration so it's fine you can join at any time there will be a telegram group for the enrolled students after theory class how should i prepare myself for mock going through notes yes so you should go through the note go through the video recording if you want to hear again and then i suggest either if you have a q bank you can go through the q bank or you can also solve some questions with your study partners how many days is needed to get access at the moment at least one week So the year start is class. So these classes are uploaded after the class. So all the question solved classes, the notes, it will require at least 48 hours to be uploaded in the portal. Okay. So it will be uploaded, but just not immediately. Yes, you will be able to watch the old session videos, which is already given to everyone. The registration of this course will be after the two weeks course, two weeks classes are finished, then we will close the registration. You can join the course anytime, but you will, not, you, you will only be able to join a single course, which means if you join in the middle of this course, you can still do that, but you will only be able to join this course, even if you join at the end of a course. Okay, Dr. Prakash. Yes, you have mock tests for, for all the topic in the portal, like cardiology, psychiatry, everything. We don't show portal, like, because these are free sessions. In the free session, we don't show portal to anyone because this is a private property. But for students who, who are paid students, they, they are already getting the access, Dr. Hammond. All right, guys, uh, that's it for tonight. And we'll, we'll have our next class on cardiology. So that's on this Friday. Start preparing what we have already done. It takes some time initially, but gradually it will become much, much easier. This month is mainly for you to get an understanding about how AMC works. From next month, you will start in a much faster way. Okay, so this month is just to get along and start reading the hand handbook, the topics that we are discussing, go with the flow. But from next month, you will need to start preparing in a very, very faster way, which we will also do. Okay.
And Dr. Prakash, what did you say? I didn't understand, sorry. Um, if you join after the course is started, I can't see other course. So it means that if you join at the middle of this course, which I don't know why, you can join now. Why you? Why would you want to join in the middle? That I. That that's one of my one of the question I'm having in my mind. But if you do that, then the other thing is that as a student, you can only join one batch. So we don't add you to the next batch if you if you join in the middle or end of a course. Okay. So if you join in the middle. You will get everything that this batch is supposed to get. Okay, so you'll you'll see everything anyone is seeing in this batch. Yes, Dr. Shula, you can still join now. All right, everyone. So very nice to see all of you. You are really actively, actively joining with the conversation. That's that I really, really like about you. So keep on asking questions. Whatever question it is, it is totally fine with me. You can ask any, any questions, but better to be informed rather than uh, being in a void where you don't know what's happening. Okay. And if anyone having any, any kind of questions about the course details, you can always go to our First Aid AMC group. So if you go to the First Aid AMC group, in here we update all the course details and everything. So go to the Featured section. And when you go to the Featured section, you will see the, all the details about the course, how, what's the duration, how many, how many days we take the class. Everything is written in here, how to contact us. So, just give it a read. Your most of the questions answered are already written in here. Okay. And only two courses in one year, Dr. Baishaki. All good, everyone. We'll finish it here tonight. Thank you all. Have a good night. Take care.